family history um, on prostate cancer incidence and aggressiveness in a large contemporary population-based screening trial, the ERSPC Arau. Yes, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I would like to show you our results regarding the changing pattern of family history on prostate cancer incidence and aggressiveness in our screening trial. And as you all know, we face a problem in daily clinical practice as about 40% of men harbor prostate cancer cells. And we need to, to, uh, to recognize those who could be harmful to the patient. So this is really, I would uh, call it an old hat because we know it since 1935 when Rich published his results on the occult carcinoma of the prostate. Uh, and uh, 20, some 20 years later, it was Franks showing that around 37% of men have prevalent prostate cancer cells. In Switzerland, for example, 6 to 8% of those men will have the diagnosis prostate cancer, but only 3 to 5% of those will die from the disease. So I just want to show you this publication from Franks from 1954. There you can see that men aged 50 to 59 and 60 to 69 harbor prostate cancer in about 30%, and he compared his series with Gaynor, who found a little lower number. So to you, that's all regular. To me, as a young, or not so young resident, it was pretty new. So therefore, we need to have risk factors to risk stratify, not just to do a mass screening, because if we do a mass screening, then we'll have a mortality reduction of only roughly 20 to 30 percent. I assume that when we perform a risk-based stratified PSA screening, then the mortality reduction would even be better and higher. So if you ask men in the US whether they have a positive family history in terms of first degree relative affected from prostate cancer, then four to seven percent will answer, yes, I have. And we know from Steinberg and colleagues that if you have a first degree relative affected from prostate cancer, again, brother or father affected from prostate cancer, then your risk is at least doubled. And of course, the more first degree relatives you have, the higher your prostate cancer risk will be. And there's a low number of true hereditary prostate cancer, around 9%. Uh, those men have more, uh, three or more relatives affected from prostate cancer. So if you look at the guidelines, then they clearly state that family history is a risk factor, whether you look at the EAU guidelines or the AOA guidelines. However, they are, um, mostly cite publications from the early 90s when uh, PSA screening was not that prevalent. And you all know that we have confounders because you all perform transuretal resection of the prostate and we, at least in the US, we noticed um, an increment of uh, prostate cancer incidence and of course the sharp increment due to the uh, increased use of PSA. And this always induces a switch in family history. So if you have a father who undergoes transuretal resection of the prostate and then ta-ta, there's a Gleason 6 tumor, then you have a positive family history. So we need to differentiate and our, um, we thought that the, this increment use of PSA screening could weaken the effect of family history. So the aim of our study was to, yeah, to investigate the impact of family history on future prostate cancer risk and aggressiveness, and therefore may, um, men were, um, were mailed a questionnaire up front to the screening visit, and then was checked for their completeness uh, during the baseline screening visit. So we had a complete data set and only first degree relatives affected from prostate cancer. Those men reported first degree relative affected from prostate cancer were considered a, as having a positive family history. So these are the numbers. You can see 4,932 men uh, who underwent baseline screening with a median baseline age of 60.9 years. And those men were followed, f followed for a median duration of 11.6 years. And 300 of those men, 334, corresponding to 6.8%, had a positive family history in terms of father or brother affected from prostate cancer, whereas 4,500 4, did not report a positive family history. So those men who reported positive family history had most likely a father affected from the disease in 70%. Makes sense because every one of you ha has a, a father, but not every one of you has a brother. So only 20% had a brother affected from prostate cancer, and then a minority had, let's call it true hereditary prostate cancer with several of, uh, brothers affected from prostate cancer of father and brother or father and grandfather affected from the disease. And basically, if you look at 
age at diagnosis, age at baseline, PSA diagnosis, PSA at baseline, there is no significance. And even if you look at the Gleason score on chi-square test, then you won't find a significant p-value. And, and I think this is the most important information. There is no significantly different interval prostate cancer rate within both groups. However, we, find, we found more prostate cancer um, in man reporting positive family history. But again, this is not the aim. We don't want to find prostate cancer cells. We want to find those prostate cancer that might be harmful to, uh, to the man. And if you translate this into a Kaplan-Meier um, estimate for prostate cancer-free survival, then of course you will see a gap between those two curves and the p-value that is significant. But again, this is not the question. And when you look at the intermediate and high-risk prostate cancer, then those two curves fit perfectly, and the p-value is far away from being significant. And if you look at the Cox regression analysis in the multivariate adjusted way, then you see that at baseline age, PSA, and family history are significant predictors, again, for overall prostate cancer. However, if you look at intermediate and high-risk prostate cancer, then only PSA at baseline was a significant predictor. So you might argue that this is a lack of power because we had only 334 men reporting a positive family history, but I don't believe. Because there were other studies, for example, the Finnish group from the ERSPC, the largest group, showing that there was no significance in men with and without positive family history. And the Rotterdam group published their results together with the Gothenburg group, stating that for men with true hereditary prostate cancer around 140 men, not everyone is at high risk. So even if you have hereditary prostate cancer, your risk must not be that high. So taken all together, we have to differentiate between the true hereditary prostate cancer uh, family history, which is roughly 9%, and I called it the screen-associated positive family history that is just a switch because of detection of a low-risk or very low-risk disease that has not that impact because the impact has been weakened. And then we maybe should not just dichotomize into family history, yes, no, but go into deep and ask at what age the first-degree relative effect that was um, the diagnosis of the, of the relative and what kind of prostate cancer, with, with what kind of Gleason score, with what PSA a diagnosis, and what was the clinical cause, and of course, what was the way of diagnosis. With these words, I would like to thank you for your attention. So, um, thank you very much. I found myself nodding to most of that, but I'm sure there are others that weren't. Um, any, anybody like to raise any questions, comments? Yes, a microphone at the back while we're going there. So are all the numerous studies, millions and millions of dollars spent on looking at germ, germline genetics, these gene association studies, is that all a waste of time? No, not at all, not at all. We, we know that there are genetic factors, but we, yeah. we have no particular genetic factor. There are lots of, of SNPs. We heard it yesterday yeah. or two days ago. But I just want to emphasize that family yeast is not just a dichotomous marker. SPSA is not just a marker from yes or no, but... As Dr. Lilia showed us, it has a long-term prediction value. Great. Two questions. Yeah. And then microphone to Laurie Klotz. Nice study. Um, I think you have... This is a really, very really complicated issue due to that PSA testing is now commonly used in the, in, in the population. So there will be an increase in, in, in the um, risk of prostate cancer solely because uh, if a man has a brother that has been detected with prostate cancer, he is more likely to undergo PSA testing. So that will be sort of an uh, aggregation of, of cases you don't really want to find. And we've actually quantified that in a study from PC Base with the first of the BRAT a few years ago. And we could very nicely see how men got a diagnosis early on after the, the, his brother had a diagnosis. And it was also interesting to see that it was men with high educational level that were at the highest risk of these kind of cancers. Laurie? The term I've heard for this is family history inflation for what you're describing. But And one way to deal with that might be to stratify what's actually meant by a family history of prostate cancer to really define it as what we know is significant, like uh, metastatic disease, death from prostate cancer, uh, diagnosis of advanced disease before the age of 60, just as three examples. So 
have you thought or tried to do this kind of analysis restricting it to patients who unequivocally have something bad? Well, we did not unfortunately have the age uh, diagnosis of the relative, so this is a limitation of the study, and this is another limitation, we have very low numbers, so our only seven men died within this time from prostate cancer, so we cannot draw any conclusions. But if you say that we need to differentiate, then I think it should be mentioned in the guidelines, and in the AUA there's just written family history, so that's a bit rough, okay. I think. So thank you very thank much you. indeed. Thank you.